Hello and welcome everyone to another Applied Flow Technology webinar. My name is Nick Vastein. I'll be your presenter today. I'm a business applications engineer here with Applied Flow Technology. And the focus of today's discussion, today's presentation, is going back to basics regarding a lot of pump concepts and pump fundamentals that a lot of engineers kind of assume are known. But this will act as a good refresher or maybe a good introduction to some of those concepts you might have forgotten or maybe never learned. So this is going to be the start of a pump concept series. Again, the intention of this webinar is to start with building a foundation. So that way, as we start to look at pumps in more detail, looking at things like efficiency and reliability metrics or transient analysis or even reverse flow through a pump, we have this as our shared background and our shared foundation. So going forward, we have a better understanding of pumps in general. So we have quite a few different topics that we're gonna go into today. We're gonna range from sizing of pumps, why do pump curves look the way that they do, affinity laws and how we can use that in some different applications, configuring different pumps, and then finally taking a look at Fathom and storing those different options. So before we get too far, let's jump into the agenda, where again, we're gonna go through the same points. First, we're gonna look fundamentally, how do pumps work? We'll look at a centripetal pump versus a positive displacement pump. What are kind of the implications of how they operate and how they would interact with a system? We'll look at pump sizing. So pump sizing really comes down to what kind of system is a pump operating within. So we'll look at what goes into the system curve and system losses in general and then how we can determine which pump will give us a operating point at the point that we need to operate at. Very intuitive naming with the operating point. We'll take a look at affinity laws or how you can change things like speed and diameter of impeller to change how your pump is gonna operate in a particular system. We'll look at some different pump configurations. We'll look at in series and in parallel and then the implications of each. While there is a lot to say about the different pump configurations, we also have an article linked in this webinar that you can pull up and take a look at after the webinar. That'll go into much more detail into why you should take a look at configuring your pumps or having multiple pumps instead of solely isolating a pump as one option. So we'll look into that. We'll look into your options in AFT Fathom on how to model that as well, as well as all these other options. Finally, we'll take a look at keeping your pumps organized in AFT Fathom, kind of a short aside of how you can consolidate all that information, keep it all natively within Fathom and within a database. That way it's easier to pull from as you're building a model or referencing in uh, future systems. So quite a few different things. All the topics are pretty introductory, but there are a lot of them. So we'll try to move pretty quickly. Of course, if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the question box if you are watching live or we will provide an email address at the end of the webinar if you're watching a recording instead. So let's jump into it. First question on everyone's mind is how do pumps work? So there's really two big categories of pumps. There's centripetal pumps and then there's positive displacement pumps. For the time being, we'll focus on centripetal pumps since that's the kind of majority of pumps that you're gonna be considering and they all follow very similar characteristics. So the way a centripetal pump works, Breaking it down to fundamental physics is you have a pump inlet and a pump outlet. So if you imagine your flow comes in, it hits what's called the eye of the impeller. The impeller is spinning at a rapid rate. What that does is it imparts momentum onto the fluid. By accelerating that fluid, it's adding energy. All of that momentum is carried until it hits this wall. At that point, all of that kinetic energy added by the impeller is converted into pressure. And that high pressure is what drives flow ultimately. So centripetal pumps are creating pressure by accelerating the fluid. That acceleration converts into pressure and that's where you're getting that pressure rise across this pump. That's different from a positive displacement pump which instead relies on kind of expansion and compression of a controlled volume. So this is one type of positive displacement pump where it's a it's kind of piston assembly but there's all sorts of other positive displacement pumps as well. Generally, what we see is that you'll see an expansion of a certain volume. What that does is it creates a relative vacuum in here. That'll suck fluid in. Then when you compress it, it'll pressurize it, forcing it out again. These check valves here ensure that flow is only going one way. 
and it's all automatic as this is driven by a motor where the piston is just going out and in. So the first big distinction between these two pumps is that centripetal pumps are going to operate on what we call a pump curve where the amount of pressure that it adds and the amount of flow that it creates depends on uh, the surrounding system or how much pressure it requires. Whereas a positive displacement pump in the most simplest of conditions and kind of simplest model of it, it's always going to be providing the same amount of volume at any amount of head rise. So the amount of volume is determined by how much this piston is stroking. So if it strokes back and it sucks in a bunch of fluid and then it compresses and it spits all that fluid out, that's gonna be a specific volumetric flow rate and then the outlet pressure or the inlet pressure coming in, that pump doesn't really care about that. It's just determined on what's the motor. As long as it can overcome this resistance to suck it in and blow it out, then it can operate at essentially any outlet pressure. So those are the first two big distinctions. Hopefully taking a look at how they're constructed will lend itself to looking at it in a more conceptual way and looking at just pump curves and system curves. And so again, this is just starting from the barest bone, starting from a foundation. So how do pumps create pressure? A centripetal pump creates that pressure by, again, accelerating the fluid with the impeller, then decelerating it with the wall, or with positive displacement, it sucks fluid in, and then by compressing it, it will create that high pressure necessary to overcome this check valve. So those are the two big pumps. Again, a lot of the concepts in this webinar are gonna focus on centripetal pumps just because those are the majority of pumps in systems. So to size a pump, we need to overcome system losses. So these are system pressure losses that includes different factors like elevation. So let's say you're pumping up a hill, you have to overcome the amount of pressure lost as it goes up the hill and the amount of potential energy lost. You have to consider static pressure. A common case is if you have a pipe under a certain amount of liquid, something like a liquid column head. And then finally, you have frictional losses through the pipes or through different components. So let's say you're pumping through like a high loss globe valve. The pump is gonna have to overcome all of those losses at our desired flow rate. So here we have an example system where we can look at a uh, reservoir where we have a lower reservoir and we're pumping up a hill. So again, we can see that elevation impact where because we're pumping up, we have to overcome this amount of head. There might be other liquid implications like it may have low liquid level and high liquid level up here. You'd have to overcome that. And then finally, anytime that there's flow, you have to overcome that friction that's resisting that flow. So we can break this down into what's called a system curve. So a system curve describes these frictional losses and these static losses at a various range of flow rates. So on the bottom, we have volumetric flow rate. On the left, we have head, where head is a form of pressure. It's taking essentially pressure and normalizing it to a fluid based on the fluid's density, where head is actually independent of fluid. And a lot of pumps will be defined in terms of head because it's independent of the fluid's density. So here we have the system curve, and we can see that as volumetric flow rate increases, the amount of losses that we have to overcome increases. We can break this down into its different components, but first we'll take a look at why a system curve is important, and in the context of sizing a pump, what our operating point is. So all of our examples today are gonna to be focused on a volumetric flow rate of 500 gallons per minute. Here we see at 500 gallons per minute, we have about 380 feet of head that the system is requiring. So if we flow at that point, regardless of how big our pump is, if we have a pump at all, the system is gonna require 380 feet of head loss to overcome. So that's our operating point. The losses to get there have two parts. The first is if we have zero flow, there's still a certain amount of pressure that we have to overcome. This is like the elevation change, or if we have a static pressure. So this is what we call the static head, and the static head is independent of flow rate. So it doesn't matter how much flow we have going through this pipe, we have to overcome the head from this lower reservoir to this upper reservoir, accounting for this elevation change. That, or if there is a static pressure difference, that would be consistent regardless of our flow rate. 
The second component is a kind of dynamic head, and that comes from pipe friction. So the faster that you flow something, the more friction you're gonna see. Here we can see that velocity term. So this is the velocity within the pipe. And then here's the resulting head loss that'll occur. So you can see that it's a quadratic relationship. That's why you see this steepening curve as flow rate increases. We'll have the same uh, losses that change with flow rate from components. Again, you see that velocity squared term resulting in a head loss. So for example, if we had a check valve that this pump was pumping through, as you increase the flow rate, you're gonna see greater and greater losses through that check valve, and that'll be captured in this curve of the system curve. So it's important to understand what goes into the system curve because your pump is never gonna operate in isolation. You're always gonna be sizing that pump in the context of a system to meet a specific operating point. So generally, these pump requirements are based on flow rate. You wanna meet a certain flow in a certain amount of time, but it may also be important to consider these uh, supply pressure requirements. So let's say you need a particular pressure at this upper reservoir, you may have to consider that in addition to your flow rate requirements going into it. So in terms of what to remember with the system curve, we wanna remember the idea of static head or the amount of head that occurs when there is no flow the dynamic head or the amount of losses caused by flow itself in the form of friction or component losses. And both of those things will inform the amount of loss at our operating point. And our operating point is generally informed by the flow rate that we want. So let's take a look at what this looks like in software. So here we're in AFT Fathom. This is just our base scenario. So starting from uh, Fundamentals, our base scenario is what we're gonna show all of our branching options and branching scenarios from. So we can see we have our lower reservoir at 10 feet of surface elevation, our upper reservoir at 200 feet. So already our static head is more than, or almost 200 feet. We can see that we're gonna have 10 feet of piping and four inch piping, so relatively small and then 990 feet of four inch piping, again, to overcome that 200 feet of elevation. And it's also gonna introduce some frictional losses into our system. So to size the pump, it's as easy as going into the pump properties window. By default, it'll select sizing. And now we can define what volumetric flow rate that we want this pump to create. So here, in our case, we're gonna do that 500 gallons per minute. We can hit okay and then we can run our system and we can review our output. So if we zoom in to make it a little easier, maybe not that far, we can go to our pump summary. And here we can see that as the pump is currently specified, we're meeting that 500 gallon per minute flow requirement. And the head to generate that is 380 feet. So now we know our operating point. We know that we need to provide at least 381 feet of head to achieve this 500 gallons per minute um, flow rate. Another way that we can visualize that is to create that system curve that we were looking at. So if we go to graph results, we can go to pump versus system and we can hit generate. And here we can see that system curve that we were just looking at. So we see the static head component. Again, it's about 190 feet, which makes sense because that's our elevation change. And then as that flow rate increases, we see how the losses increase as well. If we click this crosshair, we can go to our 500 gallons per minute, and we see that it's around that 381 feet that our pump is reporting. So that's good. It means that it's consistent. And now we have a operating point to start evaluating some different pumps at. So this is the most simple form. Again, we have a great example of how to size this and then how to select some pump curves which is a lot of what this webinar is built on. So if you want to practice these concepts in your own models, again, it's as easy as following along the examples or applying the concepts to your own system. So that's pump sizing in a nutshell. You go into the pump properties, specify your flow rate. It'll specify that and determine what kind of head loss that it has to overcome. So that is sizing the pump. Now that we understand the system and our operating point, now we can consider some different pump options. So if we again look at our system curve, 
we remember our operating point was at about 500 gallons per minute and that 381 feet of head. So as long as our pump curve will intersect that point, this is what our operating point will be depending on the pump. So I guess conceptually we have an intended operating point of 500 gallons per minute and then our actual realized operating point will be where that pump curve intersects that system curve. So in our case, the intended operating point is determining this pump curve, but it may go the other way. You may know your pump curve instead and you're adjusting your system and that'll determine what your operating flow rate is. In this case, because we're sizing, we're going the opposite direction. We're selecting that pump from our intended operating point. So as long as we have a pump curve that intersects this system curve at 500 gallons per minute, we know that that pump is going to meet that flow rate requirement. That means that we have quite a few different options and how we can intersect that curve. So we have one pump curve that's relatively flat that still intersects it here, and we have a much steeper pump curve that'll also intersect it. So that's why it isn't as easy as determine your operating point and now select the pump. Maybe if you're doing positive displacement pumps, it is that easy, but in a lot of cases, a centripetal pump is not going to meet that criteria. So we can think about this, that not all pumps are created equal. This then goes into the engineering design decision. So you need to consider things like cost, the efficiency and reliability of a pump in your system. If your system will change in the future. So for example, if you know your system is gonna age or if you're pumping a really uh, caustic fluid, how that might impact the pipes over the long run. And then there might also be other operational requirements that are gonna be independent of the pump curve. So for example, if you have very high temperatures or if you have a low NPSH that you can provide to the pump, that might also further restrict the pumps that you're considering that will intersect this operating point. So let's take a look at how we would specify these pump curves once we get some options, so that way we can evaluate them within Fathom and it makes it much more flexible to use. So again, if we go back to our, our software, now we're going to create a child scenario which in essence creates a duplicate of this model. That way we can keep everything else the same and just change how we're modeling the pump. So we'll call this pump curve option one. And now in the pump, instead of sizing, we're gonna use the pump curve specification and we're gonna enter the curve data. So this is where you specify your pump curve in terms of flow and head. And then you can also consider things like NPSH. So if you have cavitation concerns, and then also the efficiency. So efficiency is important because you wanna make sure you're operating close to an efficient thing because those higher inefficient uh, recurring costs are gonna be what uh, costs a lot more even if you're saving a lot of money on the upfront capital cost. So it's important to think long-term and how you're sizing your pumps. So here we have those two curves that I invented in Excel. And again, these are what you would pull from manufacturer data once you know your intended operating point. So once you know your flow and your head requirement, we can see that both are meeting this 500 and 381 uh, head and flow requirement. So we'll copy our first option. We can paste that in. We can generate our curve fit. And here we see that nice gradual slope. So if we hit OK, now instead of sizing it, now we're relying on where that system curve is gonna interact with this pump curve to figure out our new operating point. So if we hit okay, now if we run it, now we're looking at our output to ensure that we size this uh, pump correctly. So if we look at the pump summary, again, we were sizing to meet this 500 gallons per minute flow rate, which in this case, our pump does. So we properly sized our pump and we see that it matches that uh, head requirement that we found during the sizing process. Now, if we go into graph results, we can generate our pump versus system curve. Again, we see that same system curve, but now we see that pump curve overlaid on top of it. So if we again show our crosshair, again, we see that intersection at our operating point of 500 gallons per minute and 381 feet of head. So what we'll do is we want to save this in the future. But because I'm comparing different options, I actually want to compare pumps across multiple scenarios. So we can see over here that I've already saved an option for pump option one. 
And here we see that same curve, that same system curve, that same pump curve. We'll delete this other one, and then we'll recreate that uh, just here in a moment. So that's the first scenario. To create a multi-scenario graph, we'll actually just go through the process. We'll delete the folder. So that way, start to finish, you guys know how to generate these curves. So in the graph list manager, what we can do is right click my graphs and then click new folder. And here, if we check this box to make a multi-scenario pump versus system folder, that's exactly what we wanna do because we're comparing different pumps across the same system. We'll call this pump comparison. And now we can save that. And now we have a folder that we can save our different pump curves into. So if we regenerate our pump versus system curve, we can right click, add graph to list, call it pump option one. And now we can see that it's saved for future reference. So even if I make other changes to the model or if I rerun it, I can always reload that graph directly from this graph list manager. So that's useful again, if you're comparing other scenarios or other things, generally I do most of my analysis in terms of graphs instead of in terms of output. So that's our first option. We can then evaluate a second option. So if we create a child scenario from our base scenario, we'll call it pump curve option two. And again, the only variable that we're changing is what's inside of this pump curve. So now we can enter our curve data. Now for our second option, this more steep option, generate our curve fit. We see that now it's much higher at a peak of 700, where our original was at a peak of about 400. And then we can see how this pump will operate as well. Again, output, if we go to our pump summary, again, we're meeting that volumetric flow rate that we're designing for. We can again go to graph results, generate our pump versus system graph. And now if I add this graph to the list, it'll allow us to pump or graph both of these pump curves against the same system curves. So that way we get them in more context. This is also good if you want to compare different system curves as well. So you can get a very high density of information in these multi-scenario graphs. So to load it, we right click this folder, we click load multi-scenario graph. Here it'll give us all of our options from this list. We're just gonna load all of them in. So here we see our pump curve option one, our pump curve option two, and we see that they're all intersecting at this system curve. You can also selectively isolate different options. So let's say I only want to evaluate pump curve option one, or I can look at pump curve option two. So the more complex your system is, the more scenarios that you're evaluating, the more dense that this graph can get, but it very concisely captures a lot of different concepts that we're trying to discuss here. So it shows the different pump curves. It shows that it's all dependent on the system curve and where it interacts. That informs the operating point. And now you can imagine as we change how this system curve moves, for example, if we age the system or if we added something like a control valve, you're gonna get vastly different responses based on these two pumps, even though they operate at this same point for this particular system curve. So hopefully this is a good introduction to that multi-scenario graphing as well. And then again, relying on pump versus system curves to get a more intuitive understanding of your system and get a much wider range of data at your fingertips instead of just looking at output. So we have these curves and we have two different options for our pump. So how would we decide which one is best? Here we wanna focus more on actually what goes into a pump curve and why would a pump curve have this shape? So we have a relatively flat one and we have a very steep one. How is this gonna determine what our operating point is? Conceptually, we know that the system curve is the amount of losses added by the system, and the pump curve is how much pressure the pump is providing at a particular flow rate. So they're always gonna operate at the point where the amount of pressure or the amount of head added by the pump is the same amount as dispersed by the system. So one way that I try to conceptualize and try to explain it is if we think about um, surpluses and deficits. 
So if we think about the pump adding potential energy, it has to meet system and frictional static head requirements. Anytime that you exceed those requirements, we'll call that a surplus. And anytime that it doesn't meet those requirements, we'll call that a deficit. So if we have a surplus of pressure, imagine that you have a fire hydrant and there's a lot of pressure at the inlet. Compare that to something much lower pressure where you're gonna get a lot less flow through that same uh, fire hose. So if we imagine a potential operating point, let's say that our system starts at 300 gallons per minute, we can see that the pump is adding a lot more pressure than the system requires. All of that pressure isn't going to be wasted. Instead, what it'll do is kind of be converted into kinetic energy. So here we see that difference. That's going to drive additional flow, where again, you're still going to see a surplus, and that's going to continue to increase the amount of flow, increasing these amount of losses and the amount of pressure created until it intersects at this operating point. You can do the same thing with the deficit, where the system requires a lot more losses than the pump can provide. That means that flow rate is going to gradually decrease, again, returning to this operating point where the amount of energy that you're adding is balancing out with the amount of energy that you're dispersing. So it all kind of comes back to steady state operation. Your energy in has to equal your energy out to avoid having an accumulation. So this is more just a conceptual example of how pump curves are actually operating and why it always will return to this operating point where the pump curve and the system curve intersect. So now let's look at the shape of a pump curve. So we have these two different pump curve options. One is relatively flat, one is relatively steep. Why is there not just a standard set of pumps that work at 500 gallons per minute and 380 feet of head? So this comes down to how the pump is constructed. This is a concept called specific speed. In essence, specific speed is describing the shape of a pump curve based on the impeller shape. So if we remember the impeller from the first slide, you have the pump, it hits the eye of the impeller, how it spins and accelerates that fluid is gonna determine how much pressure it's going to create. So here it's all radial, whereas here it's generating lower head where it might be making more axial. And then you have something like a propeller where it's not hitting a wall at all and it's not really generating a lot of head. Instead, it's just focused on moving fluid. So. Depending on the shape of this impeller, that will determine the shape of your pump curve. So something like a high head impeller might have very high head at very low flow rates, or something like a propeller may be relatively flat across a very wide range of different flow rates. So all these different impellers are gonna be designed for different purposes. A common example is using a propeller. It's generally very high flow and very low head, and that's pretty bad for an industrial application generally, just because you're overcoming primarily losses through very small pipes, as small as you can get them to meet velocity requirements and keep your cost as low as possible. So it's important to consider how the curve is shaped anytime that you're gonna deviate from your intended operating point. So all of our sizing procedure was based on the assumption that this model or this system is always gonna flow at 500 gallons per minute and require 380 feet of head. So that can change. For example, if you're pumping down the lower reservoir into the upper reservoir, now you're gonna have to change how much static head you're overcoming as that lower liquid level decreases. That's called a pump down. That'll impact your operating point. An aging system. So imagine if pipe roughness increases gradually or if you scale a pipe and reduce the internal diameter, those things will impact the frictional losses causing a steeper curve in this system curve. And again, as that system curve changes, it depends on where it intersects with this pump curve to inform that new operating point. So any deviation in that system curve is gonna be at the whim of whatever this pump is operating at. And that's what's gonna inform your operating point and the flow that you're gonna get out of your system. Final thing is a change in operating requirements. Let's say that you need to increase the flow rate or you need to throttle it and decrease the flow rate down to 400. The amount of pressure that you need to remove is gonna be vastly different depending on that pump curve. And these are all considerations that you can make and fathom just by specifying the curve and then making tweaks to the system and then seeing the resulting head instead of doing it all with hand calculations, which would be slow and not nearly as comprehensive. 
So that's the concept of specific speed. Now let's talk about what lazy pump sizing is. So to begin with, let's look at what we should do with our pumps when we're selecting them. Every pump that you select should be oversized and it should be oversized for a number of reasons. One, it's gonna make sure that your pump can operate compared to an undersized pump. So if you undersize it, you're not gonna meet even your initial intended operating point. Instead, it's better to oversize it and overshoot to make sure that you're providing you know, 5% more flow instead of not meeting that design requirement. So in that sense, every pump you select should be oversized. It also makes sure that as your system ages and your losses start to increase, you have a suitable margin to overcome that and you can keep maintaining that design required flow rate. If you have potential expansions, it's better to have a larger pump to begin with than to purchase a secondary booster pump. But again, those are kind of more unique design considerations. Every case is gonna be different. Finally, if you have engineering uncertainty in the design process, so let's say you're starting very fast and loose with how you're defining your different component losses, if you are underestimating those, that would be bad to select a pump that's going to meet that exactly, when in reality you have to overcome even more losses that you might not have accounted from for. So that uncertainty, again, lends itself to why you should oversize your pump, but there are caveats. So the biggest point is that it's easier to throttle a pump with additional losses than try to reduce your system losses or adjust how your pump is operating. So if you have something like a control valve on the outlet of your pump, it's a lot easier to control and reduce the flow than it is to buy a booster pump, get that set up, make sure that it's only adding whatever four feet of head that you didn't account for. However, when you are oversizing, you want to avoid excessively oversizing your pump. That's going to cost a lot in the long run, even though you are going to be meeting your flow requirements. So you can imagine throttling a valve as immediately throwing away energy that you just added from your pump. So the more head losses that you have when you're controlling that pump, the less effectively you designed your pump to begin with. So to put it simply, adding energy in the pump only to immediately remove it through a component that's just throwing energy down the drain. And as we all know, energy costs money. Generally, as you throttle these pumps, it'll operate further from its best efficiency point. That'll lead to lower efficiency and less reliability. So you're gonna see larger operating costs in the long term as well. And then finally, it's gonna be more expensive for redundancy. So let's say you need to take a pump offline for maintenance. Generally, you would want to have a backup pump so that way you can maintain constant operation. So if you buy a massively oversized pump and now you have to buy two of them as a redundancy measure, it's just gonna be more expensive, more out of your pocket. So it's important to oversize, but you wanna always be marginal in how you're oversizing it. You don't want to kind of cut your losses in terms of the work you're doing and say, I know that this pump is gonna work and we're just gonna throw a control valve on it. It's better to take the time to properly size it account for things like efficiency and reliability, and that should create savings in the long term of your system. So now we can look at pump sizing in review. So there were a lot of different concepts there. Let's try to summarize them before we jump into a different concept. So pumps create pressure, which drives flow. So at the outlet of the pump, that's what's creating the pressure and the driving force for all that fluid to persist through the system. It's always gonna be the interaction between system losses, whether that's static from things like elevation or static pressure changes and dynamic losses or frictional losses and how the pump is providing pressure that's gonna inform our operating point. So we can size based on that operating point to make sure that our pump is gonna meet those system losses at our desired flow rate. While you can have different pump candidates that can meet the same operating point, this is where engineers come in and why you need to consider different things like costs, efficiency, and how your system might change as you're selecting your pump. So it's important to think longer term while you can meet your operating point very easily. It's very rare that your system's not gonna change or you're perfectly accurate in your uh, engineering design and your certainty in your design. So that's why you would wanna oversize, but not oversize too much and consider a lot of different options and a lot of different operating scenarios as you're selecting this pump. And the final pump 
final point, the final pump point is while all pumps should be oversized, excessive oversizing is wasteful, expensive, and often leads to unreliable or inefficient pump operation. So don't be lazy about your pump sizing. Always try to use a tool, especially if you already use AFT Fathom to properly size your pump and consider all these scenarios that we've already discussed. So aging your system or adding design factors in case there is uncertainty to make sure it's gonna meet that. Or if you want to expand the system from a pilot operation in the future, how can you try to account for that in your uh, initial design? All right, so that was pump sizing, pretty comprehensive, quite a lot to discuss, and it's a pretty big industry, so of course there's a lot of topics. The second thing that we're gonna really talk about is the affinity laws, what they are and what they're useful for. So if we go back, this is largely focused on centripetal pumps, but they can be impacted by two parameters that are pretty easy to change external from the pump's operation. The first thing is the impeller diameter. So if you imagine those impellers where fluid comes in, the impeller accelerates it, and based on that acceleration, it determines how much pressure it can create. If you trim that impeller, that will change how your pump is gonna operate. So in a lot of cases, if you shorten it, then you will have reduced head and reduced flow rate, but that might be good because your pump might be too oversized. So by trimming it, you might be getting a more precise fit to your exact application. The second variable is pump speed. This is where variable frequency drives and ways to vary the speed of the pump comes in. So that way you have, again, more precise control over the shape of your pump curve so that you can precisely intersect where you wanna operate on your system curve and then hopefully do that efficiently and reliably in addition to all the other considerations that we've already made. So these two parameters are gonna impact three parameters of the pump. It's gonna impact the flow, the head, and the power that the pump uh, creates or requires. So flow is gonna be proportional to both pump speed and impeller diameter. So if you trim your impeller by 5%, uh, all other things constant, you're gonna see a 5% reduction in your flow. Similarly with pump speed, if you double the pump speed, you would see a doubling of flow. Head increases at a quadratic or increases or decreases with a quadratic relationship. So again, that 5% decrease in diameter or doubling the speed of the pump, now that impact is gonna be squared instead of proportional. Power, that's gonna be a cubic relationship. You can also think of power as fluid power where that's the amount of flow times the amount of head that it's creating. So if you take Q times H, that equals P. So if you take N to the first times N to the second, you'll get N to the third. That's another way to think about it. But a lot of these same considerations are gonna be done for you already in AFT Fathom. So this is more just a conceptual understanding of if you need to increase your head requirement, what kind of speed change would you want to look for? So if we look at this in terms of pump curves, again, this is another conceptual example where we have a particular head and a particular flow, flow rate. If we increase speed, for example, by 25%, we're going to see a linear increase in flow rate and then a quadratic increase in the amount of head. So here you can see the spacing in flow rate is uh, proportional and then the amount of head added is quadratic. This doesn't show uh, power, but again, it would show that cubic relationship. So affinity laws are useful because it gives us finer tuning of pumps. It kind of opens up the range of pumps to consider to a infinite resolution. So we can run a pump at any speed that we want and essentially fall anywhere in between these curves. So if I had an operating point exactly here, I could change the speed of my pump and then it would intersect that operating point exactly where I need it to, instead of down here or down here. So what are some other applications for affinity laws? Before we get into that, let's see how AFT Fathom is going to model those affinity laws and where you can specify them. So again, back in the software, we can go to our workspace and we'll do all of our evaluations with this pump curve option one. So here, if we go into the pump, here we can see that we have impeller modifications. So if we trim the impeller, let's say we trim it to 
we can see how that'll impact our pump curve immediately. So we can see that it reduces. If you somehow weld on some material onto your impeller, which probably isn't recommended by the manufacturer or by AFT, you can see that the modified curve is going to extend out as well. You can do the same thing from variable speed. So here, if we say we increase our fixed speed to 120%, you can see how it increases this pump curve out where you're gonna be creating more head and more flow just because that impeller is spinning a lot faster. Something else that we can do with variable speed is determine what speed we need to run the pump at to meet a certain criteria. So this is where variable frequency drives are very useful because it's a different way to control the flow rate that you're operating at your pump instead of looking at exclusively control valves or controlling through losses. So let's do a quick comparison between these two options. Let's say, low control, and we'll do that with a VFD. Again, I'm creating a child scenario from this pump curve option one, so that way my new starting point is with this pump curve already. So I'll say variable speed and variable speed optional tab. We'll do a controlled pump, and I wanna reduce our flow rate from 500 to 400 gallons per minute. You can hit okay, and then we'll set up another scenario of flow control with a control valve instead. So what the control valve does is with a VFD to reduce the flow, we know that we wanna bring this curve in. We wanna reduce the speed and the amount of energy that we're adding to the system. What a control valve is doing is the amount of energy we're adding by the pump is fixed. And now we're just gonna add some additional losses. So that way it reduces the amount of uh, energy being transmitted to the fluid itself. So we can split the pipe which I do by holding shift and dragging the junction on top. I can have a volumetric flow rate of 400 gallons per minute, and we'll see what kind of losses that this control valve has to generate. So if we run both of these scenarios, see, we just ran that one. Now we'll run the VFD. And another thing to do to compare these very quickly is use multi-scenario output comparison. So by going to output control, which you can do with the spreadsheet and pencil, you can go to multi-scenario. You want to display selected scenarios and we want to compare our two flow control scenarios. So now we're going to see all of our same output but we're reported by scenario so that way we can compare across them very easily. Now if we look at our pump summary, we can see both cases are meeting that new 400 gallon per minute flow rate requirement but we can see that the amount of head that they're creating is very different. So we can see that the control valve, it actually increased the amount of head from 393. Let's actually add our base scenario as well. So that'll be our kind of reference point. So our original operating point was 380. We see that it increases to 390 at 400 gallons per minute. This is with the control valve where it has to overcome that additional losses created by the control valve. Whereas with the VFD, we're just spinning the pump at a slower rate. So we're creating less head to create that same amount of flow rate. We can do another multi-scenario graph where we can generate our graph. Here we have our 90% speed. And we can see that it intersects our system curve at this new operating point of 400 gallons per minute. From output, we can also see that our input speed has reduced, so now we know what speed we need to run at to achieve this 400 gallons per minute. And we see that our overall power has decreased from uh, our control valve alternative, where that would be the amount of, kind of additional pressure loss required or introduced by that control valve. So that's a good way to use affinity laws is to vary the shape of this curve, especially if you're trying to meet a set point and you have something like a variable frequency drive. Or if you know that you're operating it at a different fixed speed, you can also specify that. So now we know that if we run it at 90% speed, again, we'll see that output of about 400 gallons per minute, which is good, which is what we're intending to meet. So there's some other applications within affinity laws. The big ones that we've talked about is trimming an impeller that lets you precisely meet flow requirements. So G 
changing the pump fundamentally instead of trying to change the system and increase the amount of losses. However, once you trim an impeller, it's hard to untrim an impeller. So again, sort of like the oversizing and the general engineering margin that's built into uncertainty, it's always better to trim on the long side instead of trimming on the short side. Changing pump speed, that creates a lot of different flexibility from a single pump. Again, if we think back to the previous point where now you have a range of pump curves essentially and you can move between them very easily just by changing how fast the pump is spinning. So you can avoid issues from oversizing. In our case, let's say that we changed our operating point to 400 gallons per minute. Now we don't have to buy a new pump. We can just reduce the speed that it's operating at and not have to worry about huge control valve losses. It'll ensure that your pump and system operates efficiently. So again, similar to avoid oversizing and adding a control valve to meet those control requirements, changing the speed of the pump allows it to operate much more efficiently as an alternative. You can meet higher head requirements for aging systems. So as your system losses increase, you can increase the speed of your pump. That'll change the operating point that you can operate at, hopefully re-achieving that desired operating flow rate. And then finally, you can meet multiple operating conditions. So let's say that sometimes we run the pump at 500 gallons per minute, and sometimes we need it to operate at 400 gallons per minute. Instead of buying two pumps, you can just have one pump and a variable frequency drive to move between those different operating conditions. Of course, you can also do that with a control valve, but again, control valves are just creating additional losses and it's just throwing energy away. Instead, you can change the speed of the pump and change how much energy that you're imparting initially. So changing the input rather than the output. The final thing is that you can use affinity laws to adjust pump curves for aging or degraded pumps. So especially in very old systems where the impeller may be damaged or other considerations, just aging in general, you can degrade the pump and reduce it using something like pump speed to capture how it's gonna be operating in your actual system. One thing to note is that because pumps and systems are always interacting, it's important to consider how well calibrated your system is before you start changing how your pump curve is operating and vice versa, make sure that you are as accurate as possible with your pump curve before trying to calibrate your system. So both of those things can be iterated on and improved on, and both need to be considered, especially in cases of calibration. All right, now we're chugging along. Now we'll take a look at pump configurations. So we've looked at pumps in isolation where you really only have one pump, but often it's not very cost-effective to only have a single pump. For example, you might have a very high head requirement or a very high flow requirement, or you might have very high head and very high flow at the same time. In a lot of those cases, you're gonna require a massive pump, which costs more upfront. It's gonna be less off the shelf and maybe harder to maintain. And a lot of other costs like that redundancy of having a backup pump in case your main pump goes down. It also is not as flexible during operation. So if you have multiple operating points, maybe you could use a variable frequency drive but it'll be a lot easier instead to consider multiple pumps, whether they're arranged in parallel or in series. So you might have flashbacks to your circuits class in college, but pumps in parallel, that's when the flow path splits and then all the pumps are operating adjacent to one another. In these cases, pumps are adding flow at the same head rise. You can imagine you have an inlet pressure and an outlet pressure, and each of these are gonna contribute a certain amount of flow. That's different from a series orientation where the pumps are adding their own head, but they're seeing the same amount of flow rate. So if you think back to circuits, you can think in parallel, they see the same voltage drop where that's the same pressure rise in the case of pumps, or in series, they see the same amount of current, or in this case, the same amount of flow rate, and then they add the same amount of head on top of that same flow. So what does that look like from a pump curve perspective? Here we can see our original base curve. In parallel, again, we're adding at the same head rise. We're essentially doubling the flow rate. And so you can see here, this flow doubles, this flow doubles, so on and so forth. Whereas in series, we're adding at the same flow rate. So at this flow, we double the head, double the head, double the head. In a lot of cases, people will say that adding an additional pump may double your flow rate. But again, according to the system curve, it depends on how steep your system curve is. Again, these pump configurations, we won't go into too much detail, 
but there is attached a PDF of an article that goes into these different pump configurations in a lot more detail and a lot more nuance that you can definitely take a look at and read. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on if it was useful to you. So having these multiple pump setups creates a lot of additional flexibility. So imagine you have a huge pumping station with five or six parallel pumps. That'll give you some pretty good flexibility in terms of how this pump curve is going to be changing. So it's worth considering while you're selecting pumps, don't rule it out as an option and say, well, I can only buy one pump and it's going to be a huge high head, high flow rate pump. Maybe you can purchase a collection of smaller pumps, run them in series and meet those different head requirements. So to do this in Fathom, here we'll create another child scenario where we'll look at configuration options. And here, if we go into the pump and we go to the optional tab, on the right, we can see the number of pumps at this location. So by default, it'll be a single pump, but you can also have pumps in parallel, or you can have pumps in series, where it's gonna do that same uh, analysis where it's going to double either at the flow rate or at the expected head or your pump curve. So here let's do an example where we'll have two parallel pumps. We're going to expect the flow rate to double at the same head, which in I guess an ideal case would double our flow rate from 500 gallons per minute to 1,000. But again, because of the shape of the system curve, we'll see that we won't proportionally double that flow rate. So if we create our pump system curve, here we can see that it's still showing a single. So here it's at, oh, it actually did increase, great. So we are at 530 gallons per minute and we have a new head requirement of 403 feet. So in this case, this was very ineffective in terms of parallel pumping because we only got 30 more gallons per minute for all the capital and operating costs of running another pump. If you instead run it in series, you'd see a very drastically different response. Let's go ahead and test that as well for the sake of interest. So here we can change that from parallel to series. We can run our model again. So in parallel, we got 530 or 30 gallon per minute increase. Now in series, we can see that it increased all the way up to 777 gallons per minute. So not quite double, but definitely much better than running that same pump in parallel compared to running it in series. Again, a lot of those design decisions are gonna come down to what your system curve looks like, how steep it is, how flat it is. And a lot of those considerations, again, are in that attached article that you can download or email us at webinars at AFT.com and we can provide a copy as well. So those are different pump configurations, series and parallel. Again, that'll impact your pump curve, which will impact your operating point and is worth considering, especially during pump sizing. So the final point is kind of a small aside of how can you keep your different pump options organized in AFT Fathom. So if you have a manufacturer pump curve, it's gonna come in something like this, where you have the flow on the x-axis and the head on the y-axis. So these blue lines, we can see that's our head or our pump curve where it has that gradual decreasing slope. We can see our different impeller diameters. So if we were to trim a 10 inch uh, impeller, we know that we would fall somewhere between these curves. So that's where you can find that finer resolution. Again, applying those affinity laws to get even more efficient operation. You can also see the efficiency of the pump. So here we see 58.7 at this best efficiency point. And then as you deviate further and further from that, the pump is less and less efficient. It was designed and intended to be run at this point. So any deviation from that, for example, if you add a control valve and push it all the way back here, that will be less efficient in the long term and cost you more money. So you can extract a whole lot of information from here, and then you can translate that into Fathom and save that in the future. So here on the right, we can see the pump configurations. All of these are at 3,500 RPM, and we can capture the different impeller options with each of their pump curves. So to do that in the software, we'll create another uh, scenario, just for example. So we'll call this capturing configurations. Make sure you spell it right. And now if we add this pump, 
what I did is I already created all of these different configurations and I actually saved them to a database. So now I can quickly reference that database and now I have a range of different options to consider as I'm sizing the pump or if I know that there's six parallel pumps in the system and they all follow the same criteria, you can specify it once and then use this database to reference them. So here, if we go into enter curve data, by default, you see this simple. So if we go into our previous pump, where we only have that single pump that we're considering, we see that we have a simple configuration, but you can also capture multiple, where again, that's where you're gonna specify the flow and head that you create from those curves. It's also a good idea to include efficiency and consider that in your selection process. And then you would specify that in your um, pump configurations over here. So if you hit create, then you would add that RPM, add that diameter, and add that curve in the same way, which we can see in this created pump here, where we can copy it from here, enter that curve data, and now we can view all of the input for each of these options. So it's as simple as going to multiple and then capturing all the configurations here. It's a good way to consolidate all of that information pretty concisely and keep it organized so that way in the future, if you need to call on these pumps, then it's very easy to do so. So those are the different configuration pieces that you can capture. Again, a bit smaller in its application, especially compared to something big topic, like how do you size a pump? So we won't spend too much time on this. So that brings us towards our conclusion. We've talked about a lot of different things in today's webinar. Let's look at a summary. So the first thing, the biggest point is how do pumps work? So pumps create pressure, and that pressure is what ultimately drives flow in a system. Pumps are only going to create as much pressure as the system can dissipate. Again, you can think of it as an energy balance where the amount of energy added by the pump in terms of pressure is gonna be equal to the amount of energy dissipated by the system. That's why your operating point is always gonna depend on the system as much as it does on the pump. So when you're trying to size a pump or maybe you're troubleshooting an existing system, don't focus too much on the pump itself and also consider how the system in context is impacting that pump's operation. Maybe there's options to descale a pump or descale a pipe or redesign some high loss components to help that pump improve its operation and ultimately meet those design requirements. We took a look at affinity laws, both adjustments to pump speed and the impeller diameter, how that impacts its operation, shifting where that pump curve uh, will intersect, intersect that system curve. Again, creating a lot of flexibility in terms of its operation. And then finally, we took a look at some multi-pump configurations. So whether you're putting multiple pumps in series or in parallel, that's another option to consider, especially when you're on kind of very unique fringes of systems. So if you're pumping out of the ground and you're a thousand feet underground, that's a lot of head to overcome. That's gonna be very expensive single pump. Or if you buy 10, a lot cheaper pumps, you can probably meet that same head requirement. So definitely something to consider. Definitely consider looking at the attached article. That'll go into much more detail on the multiple pump configurations. If you wanna learn more, this is the start of a pump concept series. So this is the first installment, back to basics. Again, looking at things like sizing, affinity laws, and pump configurations, things that are covered in a lot of fluid classes. But we'll also take a look at some other factors. So how do you operate your pump reliably? Reliably, consider things like efficiency or using a variable frequency drive. How do you model transients? So if you have a pump starting up or tripping, how do you account for those in your system design? And then finally, if you have sustained reverse flow through your system, will reiterate the importance of specific speed and how that plays into what's called four quadrant analysis. So obviously if you're watching these webinars live right now, you know where to register for them in the future, but you can always watch our recordings from our YouTube channel, or if you register for a webinar, we'll generally email you that recording after it wraps up. So hopefully this is the start of your pump journey and hopefully there's a lot of opportunities to improve even further through the other installments. And we look forward to having you again for more pumps. If you've made it this far, I wanna thank you for attending, especially for the full hour. I know it can be quite a commitment, especially with engineering time, it can be uh, a lot, but hopefully it created some value for you and you learned something in the process. 
If there's any questions that we didn't get to, or if you have any lingering bigger questions about your pump and your system, feel free to send any questions to webinars at AFT.com, and I'll do my best to personally respond to them. We are in the back half of the year with our webinars and considering some topics for next year. So if you have any ideas, if you have a specific industry or a specific application that you're interested in us tackling and talking about, feel free to submit a topic to webinars at AFT.com as well. Again, I want to thank everyone for attending. Hopefully it created some value for you and now you're looking at your pumps in a new light. And we look forward to having you in future Applied Flow Technology webinars as well. Thanks again.